first and foremost, uh, thank you so much to everybody that, that's logged on for this uh, Lunch with the Friends webinar today. Uh, if you don't know me and if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Scott Beauchamp. I am the policy director for the Friends of the Boundary Waters. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Steve Emmerman, uh, who is a uh, renowned you know, expert, and he'll be able to tell you more about uh, anything related to mining than, than anyone I know, I think. So uh, we're happy to kick it over to him in a minute. However, uh, I do want to give one update quickly. We are very fortunate, uh, and, and I'm very lucky that I, that I get to give this update. Uh, many of you will have seen. Uh, just two days ago, we received a major, major win in our fight uh, to protect clean water, with that being uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer revoked uh, one of the permits for the proposed polymet copper nickel mine. Uh, we are super excited about this. Uh, this came as a result of action taken by the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, we partner with them and we follow their lead. And in, and in this case, they were the real heroes of the story. Um, they challenged uh, the decision. You know, this, this permit had been awarded uh, previously. They challenged that decision uh, because they have treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather uh, in the St. Louis River watershed, uh, in St. Louis River. Uh, they determined that their, their, they had not been consulted, which was accurate. And so what they did was they made a challenge to the EPA, to the Army Corps, and said, you need to consider if this will impact downstream water quality. Uh, as a sovereign nation, they have that right, and they were never considered. Uh, Fortunately, uh, we have a um, you know EPA that is is interested in following the science these days, and um, we're really really excited. When they looked into it, lo and behold, uh, they found it would very likely impair downstream water for the Fond du Lac Nation. Um, and so, uh, we strongly believe that this gave legal precedent that the permit must be revoked. And unfortunately, that is what happened. Uh, so the permit is revoked. This is a permit that would have allowed the polymet mine to destroy over 800 acres of wetlands, uh, which we obviously were not in favor of. Um, but it's great to see, you know, the science continuing uh, to to stack up and and at least have federal agencies recognize, you know, the extreme threat that this industry poses uh, to um, you know to the the northeastern Minnesota's water, clean water of northeastern Minnesota, um, and so. It uh, fits in very well with what we're talking about today, uh, you know, because that's what we've been preaching since the beginning. Uh, Friends of the Boundary Waters has been opposed uh, to the Polymet mine as well as the Twin Metals mine uh, from day one. Um, and we're really happy to see uh, Fond du Lac get this incredible victory. And we're, we're so grateful for them. Um, but I know that, you know, ourselves, Fond du Lac uh, and our other environmental partners will not give up this fight uh, until there's no more threats to Minnesota's clean water from this industry. So, uh, I as a, I'm not our legal director, uh, and so I, I'm not able to answer all your questions on that. We will be having a webinar uh, soon um, to answer more questions about that. Uh, for now, if you have questions um, uh, regarding the, the polymet decision, um, you can put them in the chat. I'll try to answer them at the end. Um, I might not be able to, so you know, feel free to shoot me an email and I can connect you. Otherwise, you know, stay tuned. We'll have a, a, a webinar breaking down everything about that decision soon. So. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we all took a moment because, you know, the, you know, we're fighting for, for what's right and for clean water. Sometimes it can be a, a, a tough slog. And so it's really important to make sure that we're celebrating, you know, the victories that we have. And, and really, we owe it all to, uh, you know, the Fond du Lac band and, and frankly, to science and, and scientists. So uh, I think I think I'll, with that, I'll, I'll transition into our, our scientist of the day, uh, Dr. Steve Emmerman. Dr. Emmerman uh, has a compiled an, an incredible report looking at all the claims of so-called clean sulfide mining, um, which, uh, you know, as you may imagine, uh, turned out to not be so clean. So, Dr. Emmerman, uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Scott. Okay, uh, uh, next slide, Maggie. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm, uh, oh, study <laughs> okay, so I am Stephen Emmerman. Uh, I'll be speaking on the Minnesota Prove It First Bill and the myth of sulfide ore mining without environmental contamination. Next. Okay, uh, so this is me. Uh, I'm a retired professor of geology. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors of uh, Safety First, Guidelines for Responsible Mine Tailings Management. I'm now the owner of Malach Consulting, uh, and we specialize in um, evaluating the environmental impacts of mining. Next. Uh, I've evaluated proposed and existing mining projects on all continents. Uh, I've testified on mining issues before the U.S. House Subcommittee 
on Indigenous Peoples of the United States, the European Parliament, the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and the United Nations Environment Assembly. Next. Okay, so um, um, as Scott mentioned, I have a full report on this subject, uh, Minnesota Prove It First Bill and the Myth of Sulfide Ore Mining Without Environmental Contamination. Uh, you can download the report uh, from the Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness website, uh, or you can request it directly from me. Next. Okay, so let's start with the basics. So what, what is sulfide ore mining? Okay, uh, this is how it's defined in the Minnesota Prove It First Bill. Non-fair sulfide ore means any ore other than iron ore consisting of sufficient sulfide minerals to generate acid mine drainage. Okay, that's our, gonna be our main concern here, acid mine drainage. Uh, if you see that photo on the lower left, um, that reddish brownish color is characteristic of acid mine drainage. Uh, there's acid mine drainage coming directly from the tailings dam drainage pipes. Uh, this is even after treatment uh, to remove the, the acidity uh, at the largest gold mine in Brazil. Um, you look on the right, uh, uh, this is water from uh, hand dug wells downstream of that tailings dam, the village of Santa Hita, and you see that identical reddish brown color. Okay, next. Okay, so quick tutorial on this acid mine drainage. Okay, so what is happening here is we have sulfide minerals that are below the surface and they're typically stable, um, but when they're exposed to oxygen, when they're brought to the surface, they're crushed, they're exposed to the atmosphere, a reaction goes on in which the sulfide mineral, pyrite being a typical example, iron sulfide, that combines with oxygen and water, it gives us dissolved iron plus sulfuric acid. Okay, now this oxidation of the sulfide minerals, that breakdown of the sulfide minerals, it also releases all of the heavy metals that were part of the crystal structure. Uh, could be cobalt, nickel, zinc, iron, copper, arsenic, whatever heavy metals that were in that crystal structure are now dissolved in water. Okay, so we have increased acidity in streams that are affected by that acid mine drainage and that can cause the release of any heavy metals that were attached to stream sediments. So you can get a positive feedback in which there's even more of a heavy metal load on downstream rivers. Okay, so clearly there's a detrimental impact upon municipal and private water supplies and on aquatic health. Next. Okay, now this concept that mining involves environmental contamination is generally accepted within the mining industry. That is, that is it's generally assumed. Um, it's assumed so strongly, it's usually not even mentioned unless the author has some other point that he or she wishes to make. Okay, this is an example. This is a recent article from the journal Mining Engineering, a uh, series of articles arguing against the concept that mining is sustainable this particular article is talking about the inevitability of, of ghost towns. Okay, here's a quote. This article is based on four facts. Fact number four, exploitation of individual mineral deposits or occurrences involves environmental degradation. Okay, that's simply stated as a fact. Ensuring future generation supply of mineral products requires balancing mineral product recovery with an acceptable amount of environmental degradation. Various mitigation measures can reduce but not fully eliminate the negative impacts of this exploitation. The costs of complete remediation of a mine site will eliminate the possibility of profitable extraction. Yet society's need for mineral products requires that exploitation of mineral deposits will continue into the future. Now, this point of view is actually profoundly naive. That is, it's profoundly apolitical. It kind of has the image that there's some society, like some giant town hall, where we're all debating the risks and benefits of sulfide ore mining. What are the benefits to us versus what are the risks to us? Okay, next slide. Okay, so, so in fact, there's no such thing. There's no society. There's no society that's weighing the risks and benefits of sulfide ore mining. Okay, this is from a book, Credibility Crisis, Rumaginio and the Politics of Mining Industry Reform. 
risk analysts do not normally consider whether the risk is acceptable to those on whom the risk is imposed. Rather, the question is whether the risk is acceptable to society. This does not make much sense. Society is not in a position to accept risk. Governments might on behalf of society, but society is not an entity that can make these normative judgments. However, we believe that rather than seeing the existing distribution of risk as a result of some kind of value consensus, it is better to see it as the outcome of a political process, the result of a contest between unequal political forces. And uh, I'll return to this topic uh, somewhat later in this webinar. Okay, next. Okay, so 1997 was Wisconsin legislature. Um, they passed uh, legislation called moratorium on issuance of permits for mining of sulfide ore bodies. Okay, Department of Natural Resources may not issue a permit for the purpose of the mining of a sulfide ore body until all of the following conditions are satisfied. A, the department determines that a mining operation is operated in a sulfide ore body, which together with the host non-ferrous rock has a net acid generating potential in the United States or Canada for at least 10 years without the pollution of groundwater or surface water from acid drainage at the tailing site or at the mine site or from the release of heavy metals. B, the department determines that a mining operation that operated in a sulfide ore body, which together with the host non-ferrous rock has a net acid generating potential in the United States or Canada that has been closed for at least 10 years without the pollution of groundwater or surface water from acid drainage at the tailing site or at the mine site or from the release of heavy metals. Okay, so to open a sulfide ore mine in Wisconsin, you had to give two examples. One mine that has operated for 10 years without pollution, another mine that has been closed for 10 years without pollution. They could be the same mine, but they don't have to be. Next. Okay, now over the next 20 years, um, nine candidates were proposed for sulfide ore mines that had operated or been closed without environmental contamination. Okay, so uh, of those nine, three of them were formally proposed as they went through the formal process that had been set up by the legislation, uh, but they were all rejected by Wisconsin DNR because in fact, they did have records of environmental contamination. And this was Coolatown Lake in Canada, McLaughlin um, in uh, California, Sakatan in Arizona, it's now called the Cactus Mine. Uh, six other mines came up, they never went through the formal process. It was just an informal discussion that they were candidates, but never formally um, analyzed, okay? Now, as a consequence, um, no sulfide ore mines were approved in Wisconsin during the tenure of that statute. And that impasse was only broken in favor of the mining industry when the statute was repealed in 2017 and went into effect in 2018. Okay, next. Okay, so now we come up to 2021 and the present. Uh, in the Minnesota legislature, every session since 2021, uh, moratorium on issuance of permits for mining of sulfide ore bodies. Okay, it's commonly called the Prove It First Bill, which is what I'll call it in this webinar. Okay, so what is to say? The Commissioner of Natural Resources may not issue a permit required to mine non ferrous sulfide ore unless the commissioner and the commissioner of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency both determine that a mine for non-ferrous sulfide ore has operated commercially for at least 10 years and has been closed for at least 10 years without resulting in release of a hazardous substance, hazardous waste, or pollutant or contaminant. The mine must have operated in the United States in, in a similar environment to the mine for which the permit is sought. Okay, so now it has to be a single mine. Open for 10 years, closed for 10 years, no pollution. Okay, next. Okay, now in response to this uh, bill in the Minnesota legislature, nine mines have come up for discussion as possible candidates for sulfide ore mines that have operated um, or have been closed without an environmental contamination. And that figure should look very familiar because they had exact same nine candidates that were discussed 
in the context of the Wisconsin legislation. Okay, so there's really nothing new here. Um, the nine mines that were discredited uh, between 1990 and 1997 and 2017, they have all come up again as examples of clean mines, sulfide ore mines that are operated or been closed without environmental contamination. Um, so the absence of any new candidates is certainly the best proof of all um, that there are no such mines. That is, there has never existed a sulfide ore mine uh, without environmental contamination. Okay, next. Okay, now even if, even if they had no record of environmental contamination, none of those candidate mines would satisfy the base requirements of the Prove It First Bill. Uh, three of them are not in the USA, five of them have not been closed, uh, three of them um, have not uh, operated for 10 years or have been closed, so could not operate for 10 years. Um, Prove It First Bill has, has more restrictions. Uh, the mine must have used reclamation techniques substantially similar to those proposed in the permit application. Similar environment means a location with similar abiotic ecological features, such as average annual precipitation and average monthly temperature, and in which the proximity of surface water and groundwater to mining operations is similar to the proximity of surface water or groundwater to the Minnesota site or sites for which the permit is sought. Next. Okay, now um, if we just look at the uh, climatic sites of, of each of those nine candidates, it's actually only the Flambeau and the Rainy River mines have climates similar to Minnesota. That's Flambeau in, in Wisconsin and Rainy River in Ontario. Um, if you look on the left, uh, we see a uh, monthly temperature. Um, the dark black lines are uh, minima and maxima for Minnesota, warmest and coldest sites in Minnesota. Uh, we only see Flambeau, Eagle, Rainy River um, in that range. Um, if you look on the right, uh, comparing monthly precipitation for all those mine sites, the black lines are the driest and wettest sites in Minnesota. Uh, we have in there only uh, Flambeau and Rainy River. I mean, Eagle Mine is actually a fair bit drier than any place in Minnesota. Uh, we see the vast majority of those proposed mine sites are in much drier climates, okay? So, so none of those candidates would so, uh, satisfy these base requirements, uh, but we, what we really wanna look at is their environmental record. Okay, next. Okay, now, um, of course, a lot of opposition from the mining industry to the Prove It First Bill, uh, lots of columns, lots of letters to the editor, lots of opinion pieces. Big focus on the Eagle and Flambeau mines as counterexamples, that is sulfide ore mines that have operated without environmental contamination. Okay, it's the Eagle mine in Upper Peninsula of Michigan and the Flambeau mine in Wisconsin. Okay, so here's, here's a sample quote. Uh, new and unnecessary legislation emerged at the Minnesota Capitol in January, led by Duluth's new Senator, Senator Jennifer McEwen, demanding proof that non-ferrous mining copper, nickel, and precious metals mining in this case has been done safely before allowing new mining to be, to be developed in Minnesota. I have news for the ill-informed legislators who signed on to the legislation. It can be and is being done safely already. Our Wisconsin neighbors produced copper, gold, and silver in the 1990s at the Flambeau Open Pit Mine, located just yards from the Flambeau River. The mine was closed and reclaimed without ever receiving an environmental violation. For more proof, consider the Eagle Nickel Copper Mine in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It's been operating safely for 10 years. Um, actually, when that um, editorial was written, um, the Eagle Mine had been open for only six years. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, Minnesota Congressman Pete Stauber has focused on the Rainy River Mine uh, in Ontario as example of a sulfide ore mine without environmental contamination. Uh, despite what the bill sponsor, the Democrat co-sponsors, and the Democrat witnesses today will lead you to believe, you don't have to bushwhack and portage your way to the Twin Metal site. And yes, it's in the same watershed as the BWCA. But guess what else is? An open pit gold mine, just 40 miles north of my district in Ontario, Canada. Um, it's really not clear what point is being made here. He doesn't mention the Rainy River mine, but clearly that's what he has in mind. 
Um, so just in response to um, the minds that have been recently put forward by the mining industry and, and some congressmen as examples of uh, mines without environmental contamination, I'm gonna focus this webinar on Eagle, Flambeau and Rainy River. So let's start with Rainy River, next. Okay, so this is, uh, it's actually a combined open pit and underground mine. Uh, it's a gold and silver mine opened in 2017, uh, scheduled to close in 2032. Next. Okay, well, the Rainy River mine is not a good example of anything. Uh, even before the mine opened, that is in 2016, a year before the mine opened, uh, the environmental violations started rolling in. Um, there was a sample of discharge from two in-pit sumps that is in the open pit. Uh, they found levels of unionized ammonia that exceeded the daily maximum discharge limit. Um, despite the fact the mining company had been notified, they kept discharging water from the sumps. Uh, until July 29th, they released an additional 19 million liters of contaminated water. Uh, mining company um, did not believe in the results from the regulatory agency. They arranged for their own analysis of the discharge. Their independent lab confirmed exceedances of maximum discharge levels. Uh, they still did not notify Ministry of the Environment for eight more days. Uh, mining company was fined $150,000 plus an additional $37,500 victim surcharge. Okay, same year, uh, water flowed over an embankment of a dam that was not complete caused the dam to erode, uh, allowed sediment from the dam to enter the downstream river. Uh, mining company was aware the dam was incomplete. They did not uh, comply with approval conditions. Uh, they were fined another $100,000. This is all before the mine even opened. Okay, uh, after the mine opened, the mining company as of 2021 had recorded 33 incidents of environmental non-compliance. Uh, they received an issue of uh, non-compliance or failure to compensate for the loss of fish habitat. Uh, I, I would not regard them as an example of a sulfide ore mine that operates without environmental contamination. Okay, so we can dismiss that example. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, Eagle Mine. Uh, underground mine in Upper Peninsula, Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It's owned by the Canadian company London Mining. Uh, opened in 2014, scheduled to close in 2026. Um, as an example of a sulfide ore mine, um, it actually is somewhat atypical because no ore, process, no ore processing occurs on the mine site. Um, the raw ore is shipped to the Humboldt Mill, uh, 32 miles to the south. It's also owned by Eagle Mine, and that's where it's processed into copper and nickel concentrates, okay? Next. Okay, so the big issue of the Eagle Mine has been the inability of the water treatment plant to meet whole effluent toxicity standards. Uh, and many of these exceedances of whole effluent toxicity have related to exceedances of nickel levels. Okay, so every available inspection has documented violations. Uh, not all inspections are yet publicly available, but up to the last publicly avail available inspection, everyone has shown violations. Uh, the June 2019 inspection reported on a spill of influent water to the water treatment plant, and that released uh, 2,360 gallons of untreated mine wastewater into nearby wetlands. Uh, same year, there was a spill of sulfuric acid, also reported in state inspections. Okay, next. Okay, um, there was a substantial study of uh, groundwater quality by... Uh, Superior Watershed Partnership, okay, um, reported 36 violations of allowable pH, 39 violations of allowable vanadium according to the groundwater discharge permits, okay? Now, this is a common theme throughout my report with regard to various mines that I, I reviewed. That is, when there was a history, a record of environmental violations, the response by the state uh, was to change the permits. And that happened in this case here by the state of Michigan, okay? So in 2015, the groundwater discharge permits were modified. So all the preceding violations became non-violations. That is, they raised the allowable vanadium level, 
Uh, for some mines where vanadium levels were quite high, uh, they waive the maximum daily limit. So the mining company only has to report the vanadium concentration. There's no maximum vanadium concentration. Uh, allowable pH range was expanded uh, in order to accommodate um, the previous violations of, of standards. Um, um, and this actually has been quite common, which you can read about in my report for, for various mines. Okay, next. Okay, now certainly I want to spend a bit of time on this flambeau mine. It receives so much discussion as a success story, um, but it's quite the fake success story, uh, which I will explain. Okay, so flambeau mining company. Uh, open Pit Mine is a wholly owned subsidiary of the British Australian company Rio Tinto. Uh, they mined for copper, gold, and silver from only for four years, from 1993 to 1997. Rio Tinto said that uh, by 1999, the mine had been completely reclaimed. Uh, keep in mind, this is also an atypical example in that all the ore was shipped to Canada for processing. So no mine tailings were stored on site. Um, that open pit is only 140 feet from the Flambeau River. So, of course, that's going to be a big concern of us is what has been the impact on the Flambeau River. Okay, next. Okay, now, since mine closure, which was in 1997, there have been numerous exceedances of groundwater quality standards. Okay, just an example, one month, December 2015. Mining company reported 45 exceedances of groundwater quality standards in 17 different wells on the mine site. Now, a big concern of ours is gonna be impact of the mining contaminants on the Flambeau River. So these exceedances included wells directly between the open pit and the Flambeau River, okay? Where there's two monitoring wells. These two monitoring wells between the mine pit and the river they have shown market increases in manganese and sulfate concentrations over the baseline with manganese levels so high that both wells have been in violation of permit standards ever since the mine ceased operation. Okay, an important point is that these wells that are monitoring groundwater quality between the open pit and the river, they are on the mine site. According to the Wisconsin mining laws, groundwater pollution cannot be prosecuted when it occurs within the project boundary of a mine. Okay, next. Okay, now what's happening with this open pit is that um, the mining company, when they close the mine, they put the waste rock back into the open pit and then they mixed it with crushed limestone with the idea of setting up a reaction that would neutralize the acidity. Okay, now the trouble is that that has not worked thus far. And if it hasn't worked thus far, it's not going to work in the future. And this is from the Moran report that was completed in 2019. Um, after the limestone has reacted with the waste rock, its neutralizing action will diminish and the pit waters will become increasingly acidic. And the concentrations of potentially toxic contaminants are likely to increase. As the limestone becomes coated with other chemical reaction products, the buffering action ceases it is reasonable to conclude that the flambeau ground and surface water quality will further degrade in the coming decades. Next slide. Okay, now very important is this stream C. Okay, now stream C crosses the mine site and it flows into the flambeau river. Okay. And this stream has become so contaminated, it's on the EPA list of impaired waters. Okay, now some history of this. Um, in 2005, the mining company, Rio Tinto, they contracted a study of Stream C. And that study concluded that because the copper concentrations were so high in the stream, the stream was nearly devoid of all life, including no vegetation, no insects, no fish. Okay. In 2010 and 2011, Wisconsin DNR carried out their own water quality study of Stream C. And again, based on the copper concentration, um, at that point, they requested that the stream be placed on the EPA list of impaired waters, um, and that was done. Okay, now Stream C is still on that list of impaired waters, and not only that, but an additional reach was added in 2022. 
okay, uh, for this pollution that occurs on the mine site. Um, the state of Wisconsin has issued no citations. And in fact, in 2019, the state ceased requiring the mining company to report water quality data for stream C. Okay, now this requirement was modified last year, which I'll be explaining uh, shortly. Okay, next. Okay, now, as I said, Flambeau River, that's gonna be our concern here. We have an open pit that's only 140 feet from the river, okay? Now, it's important to note that there's numerous pathways for contaminants to enter the Flambeau River, okay? First, we have Stream C that crosses the mine site that's heavily contaminated and flows into the Flambeau River, that's the first, okay? Second, there's a wastewater treatment plant that's treating water from the open pit, okay? And intentionally that water is treated and then discharged um, into the Flambeau River, okay? But also there's the possibility of water flowing below the surface from the backfill pit into the river, okay? Now contamination from the backfill pit into the river was actually predicted by the consultants for the mining company before the mine opened, okay? So this is from their report. All of the groundwater flowing through the type two high sulfur waste rock in the reclaimed pit will exit the pit through the Precambrian rock in the river pillar and flow directly into the bed of the Flambeau River. Since this flow path is very short and occurs entirely within fractured crystalline rock, there will be little if any dispersion or retardation of the dissolved constituents in the groundwater. The concentrations of these constituents in the groundwater leaving the pit will be the same as the concentrations entering the riverbed. Okay, so that was predicted by their consultants that um, water from the open pit would simply flow into the Flambeau River below the surface uh, without any change in its contamination. Okay, next. Okay, now, so this is what we, we wonder, okay, well, what, what has been the water quality of the Flambeau River? How has that been affected by the, the presence of the mine, either during operation or after closure? And the important point here is that nobody knows. Nobody knows because the water quality of the Flambeau River is not really monitored, okay? Now, if you look at that diagram on the left, um, you can see two red triangles one toward the upper left, that's SW1. Uh, that's where uh, quality of the Flambeau River is monitored. And we see that as well upstream of the mine site. And then we have SW2, um, which is 500 feet downstream of the mine pit. But there's no monitoring of Flambeau River directly across from the mine pit, which is the obvious place to be monitoring water quality, okay? Uh, so only the location used for routine monitoring is that SW2, okay? Now, you can see also in that diagram, stream C uh, flows across the mine site, very heavily contaminated on the EPA, EPA list of impaired waters. So that enters the Flambeau River downstream of where the mining company monitors water quality, okay? So how does contamination of stream C affect the water quality of Flambeau River. Nobody knows because it's not measured. Okay, next slide. Okay, now a final point is that all of these water quality measurements are only from filtered samples, which is very unusual. Okay, so let me explain what that means. Okay, that is before a water sample is analyzed, that is right in the field, it's collected and it's forced through an ultrafine filter. It's a filter with a mesh of 0.45 microns. A micron is a millionth of a meter. So quite a fine mesh, okay? So what filtering does is it removes all solid particles, meaning it might remove solid particles that could have contaminants attached to them, which is quite common, okay? Now filtering always gives you a better water quality because you've removed the solid particles that might have contaminants, okay? Now, that is contrary to the standard mining industry practice, I, I would say for the last four decades, okay? The practice has been that you collect both filtered and unfiltered samples, you analyze both, you report both, okay? So it's not clear that the water quality that's been reported is even accurate or representative, okay? Next. Okay, um, 
Well, that has not been a very cheery story about the flambeau mine, uh, but it's still touted as a success story. It's quite the fake success story. And a lot of that success has been, has rested on the basis that uh, the mining company received a certificate of completion. Okay, December 20th, 2022, Wisconsin DNR issued a certificate of completion of reclamation for the Flambeau mine. Okay, now it's important to note what this certificate of completion says and what it doesn't say. Okay, all it says is that the mining company completed its reclamation plan. It did exactly what it was required to do according to that plan. It doesn't say the reclamation plan worked. It in no way states there's been no environmental contamination. Uh, the response to that uh, certificate um, was excellent by D Deertail Scientific, Wisconsin Resources Protection Council, and Sierra Club Wisconsin chapter. So I, I will quote from them. In handing down this decision to certify that FMC has successfully reclaimed the Flambeau Mine project site, the DNR cited provisions of Wisconsin's mining code that allowed them to do so. Primarily, they focused attention on their determination that FMC, Flambeau Mining Company, had completed reclamation in accordance with the approved reclamation plan. That approach was consistent with what FMC had maintained in a legal brief filed in 2007, the first time the company sought COC certification when making their legal arguments before the judge. Okay, so note that the mining company went to court to try to force the issuance of this certificate. The company characterized the COC process as simple and limited to essentially checking off whether FMC has or has not completed certain specified reclamation tasks. Absent was any consideration of whether or not the reclamation plan had actually succeeded in protecting public waters. In other words, Wisconsin's mining laws simply require a mining company to prove they did whatever the reclamation plan said they were going to do. Okay, next. Okay, now it's very important. Wisconsin DNR has never ever said that there's no environmental contamination from the Flambeau mine. Um, in fact, they said the exact opposite. Um, they asked EPA to place uh, a portion of the mine site on the EPA list of impaired waters where it still is. And that same year, uh, they asked that another reach of the stream be added to that list of impaired waters. Now, various people, opinion pieces here and there have claimed that reclamation bonds for the Flambeau mine have been released, uh, and that is not correct at all. Uh, Wisconsin DNR has said the exact opposite. Uh, in fact, they are saying that it still remains to be seen what has been the level of environmental contamination and how it will be addressed. Uh, this is from Wisconsin DNR uh, last December. Uh, DNR and Flambeau Mining Company have agreed that additional assessment of the biologic condition of Stream C is appropriate to determine whether Stream C is attaining its designated uses. The department anticipates the company will initiate assessment activities in 2023 and that all critical aspects of the work, including sample collection and analysis, will be verified by DNR. The revised mining permit will remain in force until the remaining reclamation bond is released, which will not occur for a minimum of 20 more years. Okay, next. Okay, so no examples. No examples of sulfide ore mines that have operated or been closed without environmental contamination. So, so what, what is the prove it first bill? It's essentially a 20 year moratorium. Okay, it's a chance for the mining industry to show that it can operate a sulfide ore mine without environmental degradation. Okay, when could that happen? 20 more years. Uh, it'd have to be uh, a mine that opens in 2023 where it ceases contamination in 2023, this year, operates till 2033 without environmental contamination, closes in 2033, and then still has no record of environmental contamination as of 2043, okay? It's essentially a 20-year moratorium on non-ferrous sulfide ore mining in Minnesota, pending the demonstration of sulfide ore mining without environmental contamination someplace else, in some other jurisdiction, not in Minnesota, okay? What, what do I mean by this? Why, why do I mean some other jurisdiction? Next. 
Okay, it's because Minnesota has no obligation to be the sacrifice zone for the testing of new technology. Okay, now this phrase sacrifice zone, I think is becoming one of the ugliest phrases in the English language. Uh, this recent um, philosophical paper um, explained the meaning of the term, just a short quote, what is the sacrifice zone? It's fundamentally a geographical concept about the production of space. Environmental harms are concentrated in some places in order to protect the environmental health and sustainability of other places. Geographies of environmental sacrifice have been the necessary corollary of geographies of environmental abundance. The latter depend on and are constituted by the former. In short, the sacrifice zone concept signals a we who are singled out by some criteria as an acceptable sacrifice and they who use the powers of state, market, and mindset to, to do both the rationalizing and the sacrificing. Okay, and recall how I discussed this earlier in the webinar. In the webinar. There's no single entity called society that's deciding, that's balancing the benefits and risks of sulfide ore mining. These are political decisions that are the outcome of contests between political players who often have uh, very large differentials in power. Okay, next. Okay, now Minnesota has no obligation to be a sacrifice zone and who does? The answer is nobody. Nobody, no place has an obligation to serve as a sacrifice zone. And this is a very new idea. It's a very new idea. It's a very new and ugly idea in human history, this concept of a sacrifice zone because I see no basis for that in any world religion and any traditional values. Okay, next. Okay, now I, I really just wanna kind of emphasize when, we, when people talk like this, when people talk about the sacrifice zone, how far they have come down from what I would regard as traditional values. Okay, now this is from the um, past president of Geological Society of America last year, um, talking about the sacrifice zone. As for me, I accept the degradation of part of our environment for the betterment of the whole to get sufficient energy production to keep our society functioning and bring health, electricity, and better living conditions to the rest of the world. And although to some it may seem callous, I accept the loss of the pristine deserts in South America to get the lithium we need. Okay, so he's saying the deserts of South America, they should be the sacrifice zone, but it will be lost, okay? No choice, resistance is futile, it will happen and probably has to be lost unless we find another way to build Teslas. Of course, Tesla, everything is about the needs of Tesla, Teslas and other batteries. Okay, now it should be clear, I am completely rejecting this point of view. Uh, this has no basis in any traditional values or world religions. Nobody has to be the sacrifice, especially this discussion of pristine deserts. I, I mean, traditionally the desert, the, the wilderness is a place where you go to grow spiritually, where you go to find God, uh, to say now it's the sacrifice zone so the Tesla can have its batteries. Uh, we come a long ways and not in a positive way. Okay, next. Okay, so I'll end with three take home messages. Okay, number one, there has not yet existed a sulfide ore mine that has either operated or been closed without environmental contamination. Number two, the Minnesota Prove It First bill is a 20 year moratorium for the testing of new technology for mining sulfide ores without environmental contamination in some other jurisdiction which I emphasize. Neither the people of Minnesota nor anyone else, which I emphasize, has the obligation to serve as a sacrifice zone. And so with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ehrman. That is, that is right on. Um, and yeah, let's, let's get right to the questions. Um, I see someone says, uh, what does reach mean in this context, additional reach added in 2022? 
Okay. So that was a few slides back. Okay. 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 So that's okay. So that's a good question. It's just a matter of kind of a stream vocabulary. Okay. Uh, so I have a stream. A whole stream can be very long. Um, when we talk about a reach of the stream, it's a portion of the stream that is similar in various ways. Okay. So um, initially, not all of stream C was on the EPA list of impaired waters. Only the portion with very high copper concentrations. Um, that was downstream from the mine site and, and still on the mine site. Um, Wisconsin DNR asked that an additional part of the river farther upstream also be on the list of impaired waters. Okay, so they extended how much of that stream was on the list of impaired waters. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, and, and you know, one thing that, that comes to mind, Dr. Emmerman, when, when I think about this is you know, how often people that disagree with me tell me that, well, that we're Minnesota, we, we do it right. This couldn't happen here. So what you're telling me is there's nothing magical about Minnesota that prevents pollution here. Okay, I would say, okay, I, I would say there's nothing, well, I'm gonna say quite the opposite, okay. Um, so so I, I can give kind of, kind of two points on this, okay. The first is that, especially if I look at the Boundary Waters area, um, it's an area that could be very sensitive to pollution, uh, very sensitive to addition of sulfates, very sensitive to addition of other contaminants, okay? And a lot of that is due to the fact that the riverbeds are so rocky and there's kind of a lack of buffering action in these rivers, okay? Um, and I think there's actually been some previous webinars on this subject, um, um, Amy, Amy Mirvo. I uh, gave a good webinar on that subject, okay? Now, the second issue is that uh, many people simply insist Minnesota has the highest environmental standards in the world, um, which is actually, is, is, is actually not true, uh, okay? Um, I could name four Latin American countries that have a higher environmental standards, which would be Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, and Chile. Um, so so that's, that statement is simply not true. Okay, so no, there's, there's nothing magical about Minnesota. Okay, what 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 I would like to see magical about Minnesota is for Minnesotans to say we are not the sacrifice zone, and mean it, and have it put into practice. Yes, that would be magical. I would like to see that. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Well said. Um, so okay, we got a couple other questions here. Uh, what is the definition of designated impure water? Okay, so 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 the word is actually impaired. Okay, um, EPA has a list of impaired waters and basically the way it works is states apply to have streams placed on that list. And um, I couldn't tell you the latest as to what are the criteria. Okay, that is what are the EPA criteria. Um, in Wisconsin's application to EPA to have stream C based on that list, they cited two things which were the very high copper concentrations being the range of about 10 times the EPA standards for aquatic health um, and, and the lack of any living thing. Okay, that certainly sounds like impaired, okay? Um, so that stream C met the EPA criteria, um, but I couldn't tell you exactly what those EPA, EPA criteria are. I think if you Google EPA impaired waters list, um, uh, you'll find that laid out for you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's well, well said. Um, there's a couple questions that I can maybe answer, but I, you know, in a minute here, but I just want to make sure I'm getting the scientific ones to, to you, Dr. Emmerman. Um, although you may not know this, so, so feel free. And someone asked, does, does the Supreme Court ruling on wetlands have any bearing on this? Are, are you informed about that? Or otherwise I might have to take that one offline and get you in touch, Carol, with our, with our legal director. Um, I, I guess I'd rather have your legal director address that question. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Carol, follow up with me after this. Um, I'll put my, and this goes for everyone, I'll put my email uh, in the chat. And if we don't get to your question, or if we're not able to answer it here, please let us know. Um, and, and so we can go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, go ahead and get that answered for you. Um, uh, and someone says, uh, is is the mine in Ontario downriver, not upriver from the BWCA? 
uh, and therefore well in the same watershed, it's unlikely to flow upstream. Um, so essentially, where where is the Rainy River Mine Gold Mine located in, in retro or in regard to the boundary waters, Doctor? It's Lewis? downstream from the boundary waters. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would say it's not it's not in the watershed, the boundary waters, because it's downstream. Um, I, I gave the exact quote from Congressman Stover, so you can decide best as I can what point he was making, which was really is not it really was not clear what point it was being made, but uh, the Rainy River Mine seemed to be some kind of example of something. So um, I, I did review the environmental violations of that mine. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's, you know, a good reminder for all of us when we're listening to the, the debate around these mines, you know, if, if someone doesn't quite understand that water flows uh, downward, you know, downstream, um, not upstream, you know, maybe they're not the greatest source uh, to, to, be, to be weighing in on, on the pollution of these projects. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's one, another question I want to answer. Uh, and I have some ideas on this, Dr. Merriman, but what what do you, what can you know some of some of our our members here are in other states fighting these fights. Um, what, so if someone says you know from from Maine and from Virginia, uh, what can they learn and apply from your report? Um, you know to to their 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 own fight against uh, you know pollution. Okay, yeah. So these are these are excellent questions. Um, I, I know in, in uh, state of Virginia uh, they have their own. Uh, uh, Prove it first ordinance uh, being promoted by Virginia Community Rights Network and, and some other groups. Okay. Um, so, okay, the question is what, what can they learn from this? Okay. Um, I, I, I guess the most important thing is that someone could ask the question whether this is necessary. Is a prove it first bill necessary? Okay, because is there any? Where are the examples? Uh, are there any? Can you find any example of a sulfide ore mine that is operated without environmental degradation? Well, I was I was unable to find any examples, regardless of all the examples that were being proposed by various people. Okay, so someone could argue, well, that's already been done. Okay, um, it's already been established. There are no examples. So if if some jurisdiction doesn't want Sulfide ore mining, we ask questions about it, why not just ban it completely? Why, why bother with prove it first? Okay, it's a question you could ask, okay? Um, um, other than that, I, I would still stick with what I said originally that um, it's a moratorium. It's a chance for someone to prove the technology can exist somewhere, but everyone, anyone is free to say, well, not here. Let someone else, let someone else be the sacrifice zone. Okay, and if the whole world says none of us want to be the sacrifice zone, then I'd say, well, it's not going to happen. Okay, N nobody has to offer their jurisdiction as the testing ground. Yeah, well said, and and actually, you know, I, I want to use that to transition into another question, um, where you know, essentially, someone says, uh, uh, you know, where where can we, how do we propose that the U.S. obtain essential minerals? Uh, well, ensuring, you know, if, if other countries don't have these these standards, right, you know, how are we going to ensure that there's no environmental degradation? And, and I'll let you weigh in in a second, Steve, but, you know, essentially what I would say to, to that is, you know, I think this is a really common misconception that we hear often. You know, I think, one, uh, the amount of minerals in the United States, or in, in Minnesota in particular, are a drop in the bucket to the overall mineral uh, reserves of the, of the world. Um, so no matter what happens here, we could open all the mines here. It's not going to change any practices around the world. You know, those those countries and those operations are still going to operate as poorly and as often as they want to, right? And then, you know, secondly, I think also we need to remember, especially when we're talking about this, copper is not a critical mineral. Uh, you know, copper is considered abundant. Copper is not considered a critical mineral. Uh, so when we're talking about copper mines primarily with with you know the ones in Minnesota, uh, we're also talking about that. And then third, I would say is. Recycle, recycle, recycle. Uh, you know, I see one of my colleagues, um, you know, who's done some amazing work on recycling, uh, and then they did a study that found that if we were to recycle 100% e-waste in Minnesota, uh, it would create more jobs and more metals than all these mines uh, in Minnesota proposed combined. So uh, when we think about that, that's a way to actually make sure because you know we think about oh how can U.S. have this? 
well, it doesn't really matter if they're mined here, if it's a company that's going to sell the metals abroad, it's not going to some type of uh, reserve that only the United States can use for clean energy, right? And so uh, we just need to make sure that we're, we're kind of pushing back on those misconceptions uh, that we need to somehow mine here to, to save the world because it's not just not accurate, um, at least in my view anyway. Uh, let's see here. I'll, I'll do one, uh, one more question, uh, here, um, for Dr. Emmerman. Someone said for the proof first bill is a level of contaminant defined as something above a level of safety or above the original baseline. Um, okay. You may not have the language off on, on, on top of your head. Well, the, the language talks about a hazardous substance, okay? Now, I'll let you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that bill defines a hazardous substance as above some uh, standard, above some health standard or environmental or aquatic standard. It does not mean above the baseline, okay? Am, am I correct there? Yes, yes, that is... That is that is my understanding as well. And, and so, you know, I guess I would just say to everyone, uh, we do have to wrap up here. Um, so a couple couple things I want to leave you with. Uh, my email is in the chat. If you have questions for myself or Dr. Emmerman, please shoot me an email and I and we can get in, in, in touch and, and answer more of these because um, there's some really good questions that we didn't get to answer. Uh, one thing I do want to touch on briefly, someone mentioned, can this bill be passed in the legislature now? Uh, there's no reason it can't, can't be. Uh, you know, we believe this should be a bipartisan issue. Uh, as of now, there's no Republicans supporting Prove It First, but we'd love to have some on board. That being said, there are 74 legislators supporting this bill. Uh, we need about a couple key ones. So make sure that your legislators are supporting this uh, to get it over the line. We're close, but we're not quite there yet. So we need Governor Walls on board uh, and we need other key legislators. So please check out our website, Prove It First, uh, and you can see if your legislator is on board there. Uh, and, and if not, you know, please let me know. We have take action forms because because we need them absolutely, and we think this uh, really should be passed next year. Uh, I do have to give a quick plug uh, for what's next. If you're in Minnesota, uh, please join us on Thursday, June fifteenth, for Friends of the Boundary Waters uh, open house at our St. Paul office. Uh, we want to welcome everybody in. Now that the weather's a little nice, and you know, come talk Boundary Waters with us. That's next week. Uh, if you're in Ely, Minnesota, uh, please come to our Authors Roundtable uh, with Carrie Griffith and M Amy Hepp uh, on July 29th. Uh, and, you know, that'll be our Ely office. And then, you know, just for the those on the chat, uh, if anybody's interested in, in getting more involved in Prove It First, we do have a monthly Prove It First coalition meeting that members of the public are welcome to join. Um, this is a group of environmentalists, uh, environmental nonprofits, uh, legislators, um, and others who care about passing this bill. So I would say if, if you're in another, if you're one of our friends in another state um, who wants to know a little bit more about this, I would definitely encourage you to come to the meetings. Um, and uh, and yeah, please, please shoot me an email and, and I'll get you that. And, and this webinar uh, will be recorded and will be available um, afterwards. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emmerman, for, for all your great work. Uh, we really appreciate it. Everyone go read the full report uh, and we will talk to you all uh, very, very soon. Thanks so much, everyone.